And JC, do you have to speak as rates come down? What sectors benefit? I must say I'm liking Nike at current levels. We've got NVIDIA results and ETF, ETFSA listing and ETF. This is JC Direct, episode 601 for 29 August. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. A quick heads up for next week, no show. I will be on the beach down in KZN. I will be back, uh, what, for 12 September. And then we have a raw to the end of the year. Uh, I think 13 December is our last working day. So no show next week. Otherwise, everything is going to be normal. Let's start with rates. Uh, and, and in particular, let's start with what Jerome Powell said uh, l- last Friday at Jackson Hole. And I quote, to the eight words that matter, the time has come for policy to adjust. In other words, here I come rate cuts. I mean, it, it's just that simple. The September meeting, which we've spoken about a lot on 18 September, uh, we follow the next day on the 19th, they're going to be talking rate cuts. They're going to be talking around, is it 25 or 50 points on the way down? My sense is it's going to be 25, and if it's 50, the market's going to be a little bit spooked because the market's going to say, well, what has Jerome Powell and his team seen that is fundamentally scaring everybody? Uh, And that's a fair point. So I think 25 points, there's three more meetings from the U.S. that will take them down by three-quarters of a percent by the end of the year. There's two more in South Africa that will take us down half a percent by the end of the year. Here's the market expectation over the next two years for what is expected the Fed fund rate would do, essentially looking for around 2% in total lower over the next two years. So it starts quite steep, as you can see. Uh, what the, By the end of this year, they're expecting a percent lower. I think that's a little optimistic. And then, of course, tails off by the end of next year. But in essence, we're now in rate-cutting territory, which then raises the question. So rates are coming down. We've had a long time of high rates, and let's be clear, they've been uh, not record highs, but certainly generational highs. Who wins? What what sectors, what stocks win from lower rates? Well, those with lots of debt. So any company with a lot of debt is in a better position. And I've seen it just chatting with CEOs in the JSC over the course of the last year or two. Uh, the higher debt has been hurting. It absolutely has been hurting because of the interest payment. So if you've got a lot of debt in the balance sheet, the higher rates help. Now, maybe the lot of debt in itself is a concern. Uh, consumer stocks. And yeah, I've been buying consumer stocks and talking about them all of this year. Mr. Price, the Vichini Group, ShopRite. Digging into the data, it does look like food retailers perhaps uh, are, are the biggest initial winners. Then it comes to sort of clothing and, and, and the like. And then finally, we move on to the, the DIYs, the cash builds, and those sort out there. But the market's kind of known that already, right, and been pricing it in. But I still think there's some upside there. And and I look at stocks like, you know, the Mr. Prices of the world, which are trading at 52-week highs. I think we up some, if memory serves, 40% this year plus dividend. Uh, Certainly looking really, really good in that regard. Uh, So winners there. But also cars. Uh, Auto Trader had data out last week that used car sales were up 14% year on year, year over year rather. That's a big number. I think we'll start seeing a pickup in uh, in new cars as well. Again, they're going to be a little bit later. Food and clothing, I think, is going to come in fairly quick into the process. And then down the line, we'll see the home improvement. We'll see the car sales. Uh, CMH, which I hold. We've also got Motors. We've got We Buy Cars and uh, Zeta, uh, the uh, car company, not the agri company, of course. The other one is REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. And the reason here is because investors have been buying government treasuries, bonds, call them what you will, heck, money in the bank, whatever it was, and you were earning a good yield. You didn't need to go and take the risk of buying an equity or a REIT. You could simply go and buy a government bond, money in the bank, which is, depending on the bank and the government, pretty much risk-free. But now those rates are down. I mean, the the U.S. 10 years coming down, uh, South African 5 and 10-year rates are all coming down. Nothing new around that. So 
Where do investors go? Well, they'll go to things like utilities and the like. But in South Africa, they're going to be going for REITs, for that quality there. Now, which ones? Storage, which I hold. Uh, Spear, which is Western Cape focused. Uh, Vukile, these are three that uh, Gary Boyson mentioned on my show on Monday morning. Certainly, I think we're going to see, we've seen an uplift already. And that those stocks have done well since the beginning of the year already. In fact, since October of last year when they bottomed. But I think there's still some more upside there. I certainly think we can still see some more buying. Now, what you'll notice from those list of stocks, very little, if any, office. Office is improving and has been improving for probably two years now. But office is still a horror. The vacancy rates are still, in many cases, around 20%. Uh, rental reversions are still negative. They're less negative than they were, but they are negative. So I think it's important that that, that office perhaps is still on the back burner. A lot of folks like Growth Point, uh, certainly looking good, but a lot of office and Growth Point. What I don't like about Growth Point, and I've got no problem with it, but why don't I hold it is quite simply because it's just so giant. It's just such a giant. There's so much to it. It's almost like buying an ETF in the REIT space, in which case, buy an ETF. Uh, CS Prop is the one I hold. Uh, STX Pro is another from Satrix. Actually, I hold that one as well. So there's the ETFs, and a lot of folks are going to look at these and say they've run. They have. But remember, you're going to be getting about a 10% yield just on the dividends coming through. Economic activity will uplift them. And then if we can see some folks rushing in to buy them, that might take some shine off the yield down the line, but you'll get capital appreciation as well. So uh, will, consumer stocks, we understand that part of the component. Uh, companies with large amounts of debt, we understand that. And then REITs, the other sector that I think is going to be best positioned as we head into a, a interest rate cutting environment starting September. So we have uh, events coming up as we uh, do, well, every month we're having events. We're going to be doing a whole lot with ETFSA. They're not yet on the website, but they will be soon. I'll touch on that in a moment. We had our power hour with Mishima Gama last week. We were talking charting with Mishima. If you go to justonelap.com slash power hour, you will find the video there. It is well worth your time. Uh, and then 19th September, the power hour is going to be me. I'm going to be looking at psychology of markets and for both trading and investing. And then we've got October, Adrian Seville. We've got November, Keith McLaughlin. And December, I am back and I'll be positioning your portfolio for 2025. I hope to have the ETFSA events up soon. We've got a webcast in October. They're doing Durban, Joburg, and Cape Town as well. Hopefully those will be online by the end of the week. Just one lap.com slash events for more information and booking. So let's stay with uh, ETFSA for a moment. They have uh, listed a actively managed ETF, Balanced Foundation ETF. Now, a, a lot happening there. I suppose the first part is let's say, well, why actively managed? Well, why actively managed? Because typically an ETF follows a index. And in this case, there isn't an index. So what they have to do is say, well, there's no index. So what do we do? Well, we then have to actively manage it. It is currently an IPO. I will get to what that means and how it's working in a moment. But it's a balanced foundation. It's that ETF that sits at the core of your portfolio. And then you take thematic uh, uh, systematic bets around it in terms of perhaps other ETFs, maybe NASDAQ, India, China, whatever the case may be, or individual stocks or you know, resi, whatever. It's going to hold 30% local equity, 5% local property, 25% local bonds, cash 5%, and then 35% foreign equity. Most of that will be held by other ETFs. It's going to come in at a total expense ratio of, if memory serves, yep, around 52, around 0 0.52 rather. And what we're doing, what they're doing, is it lists on Monday, 2nd of September, but it is already trading. And what the trading is, is basically just a book build process that is currently happening. And what I mean by that is they have it on the market and you can see a seller at 10 Rand. So you can go and buy it for 10 Rand, and it will be there until close on Friday. You go and buy a 10 Rand, you're not going to get it cheaper, you're not going to pay more for it, you will pay 10 Rand for it in its entirety. If we check it, volume gone through, 414,000 and some change, so already a little over 4 million Rand gone into it. 
So this is how they're doing the IPO. And then on Monday, it will start trading with those assets. They will go and uh, sort of seed it on, on uh, uh, Friday afternoon, Friday evening. And on Monday, it will start trading at its fair value and off it will be to the races. What I like about this IPO process, it's just nice and simple. It's just clean. It's absolutely clean and simple. It is active, but you can put it in a tax-free account. There is just one lap.com slash ETFs. Uh, I did an interview with Gareth Stobie. That is online. You can go and listen to more details there. It will pay dividends. It's not going to be – it's a balanced foundation ETF, right? It is not going to shoot the lights out. It is not going to make you rich by the weekend. It's that core holding. ETF S A B is the code. Uh, I like it. And just for the record, we are joint promoting it with ETF S A. Uh, so let's go and have a look at NVIDIA. We have NVIDIA results out after the close. I'm recording this on uh, Wednesday afternoon. After the close today, we have NVIDIA. After the close in the US, we have NVIDIA results. I hold NVIDIA shares. The point here is really quite simple. What is the market expectation? So the market is expecting for second quarter earnings per share of 64 cents, revenue of $28.48 billion, uh, and guidance of EPS to for 70 cents in Q3 and $31.4 billion revenue in Q3. That is what the market cares about, that expectation. NVIDIA is probably going to move 10, 15, maybe 20%. That's a lot. But NVIDIA is going to move on these results. If they miss, it moves down. If they don't miss, it moves up. Uh, certainly, analysts are bullish of NVIDIA. But there is also a fairly large, uh, how do I spell, in, uh, sometimes spelling is hard. Actually, I'm just terrible at spelling, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA. There is about 1% short position in NVIDIA, which is $300 billion. Yeah, no, $30 billion. No, my math was wrong, $30 billion. Um, if the results are better than expected, we're going to see a short squeeze of note because pretty much anyone who has gone short of NVIDIA, as the stock is trading just off all-time highs, anyone who's short here, apart from a couple of periods back there in June and July, anyone short is at best at break even. So if we get a good set of numbers uh, coming through from NVIDIA, this thing's going to pop and it should take some, some uh, of those shorts with it, which will help it pop. If it misses, well, then it misses and then we're collapsing. On the upside, I mean, it's going through 140 nice and easy. Uh, and on the downside, if it's collapsing, I mean, 110, ultimately, I think probably back down to sub 100. As I said, I hold it. I hold it in the uh, ETN from F&B. So I hold it to my JSE account uh, and we shall see. I there have been some uh, production challenges in getting uh, 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 the units out. There is still more demand than there is supply. Make no mistake about that. But they have had some challenges, quite simply, in, 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 in their production processes. So they might not have been able to produce as many as they would have liked. And as many as they can produce, people are buying. People are queuing up for them. So, but this is a, you know, it used to be back way back in the day, it used to be 10 cent. Those used to be the exciting results we would all wait for. Uh, now we're all waiting on NVIDIA and we'll see how the NVIDIA results come. But another stock I am having a very, very close look at has been Nike. Is it Nike? Is it Nike? What is it? I don't know. And you know what it is, and I don't want to say there's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because that's complete and utter nonsense. We get many opportunities through a lifetime. But much like with Disney below 80. So here's Nike, Nike, the weekly chart. It is bang on multi-decade support. If we zoom that in a whole bunch more, we can absolutely see it bang on multi-decade support. If we look to the daily chart, we've got an island reversal down there at the same time. Uh, and that island reversal is once again bullish for a run up to around 90. So I need about 85 at this point. That's not a massive run significantly. Uh, all time highs are 180. It got well ahead of itself during the, the, the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. It's absolutely been getting nailed. Uh, the current, the 80 level is also significant all the way back to pre-pandemic. My argument for Nike is quite simple. It's not going away. It is one of the preeminent, one of the preeminent global iconic brands up there with Coca-Cola and I would argue Disney at the same time. Has it had a tougher time? 
Sure, it absolutely has. But if I pull up some of the other charts, so Dex, just go look at EPS dividend and uh, sorry, uh, dividend and revenue. Yeah, revenue, and let's take that. Yeah, that's ten years. That's plenty. Revenue hasn't been collapsing. Yeah, EPS has been sideways for a bit. Dividend has been ticking higher, uh, and revenue has been growing. If we look at uh, revenue and um, margins, margins have held. Margins, which is that little gray line there, margins have been holding your net, uh, uh, sorry, your net income margins. We've just seen a company that got massively expensive. But now let's be clear. It is not cheap, right? It is still on a 20-odd PE, but at times it's been on a 40-odd PE. I mean, can it fall lower? Yes. But I'm looking at this quite simply and saying I'm buying Nike, as I said, one of the one of the most iconic brands in the world uh, in an Olympic year, and I'm buying it at one of the cheapest levels that we have seen. There's your price earnings with uh, price to book. It is its average PE over the last uh, t decade is 38. Its current PE, and let's look at the forward PE, is 22.9. Standard deviation one below the average is 21.9. You're buying it almost on a standard deviation below. And truthfully, where it used to trade, I mean, it's been back here. 2017 and so. So it's just, you know, it's not a case of, and Nike's had some, some challenges, but it isn't like they have completely collapsed and that things have gone absolutely horrid. Now, yeah, I'm buying some. I haven't yet bought them. I'll get them in the Shift app uh, and I will buy them this evening, Wednesday evening, or maybe Thursday, depending if I remember or not. But it's the similar ish with uh, 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 Disney. And I've been picking up some Biz Disney's. Why? Because, again, it's one of those absolute iconic brands. Now, they've had some challenges with their streaming. Uh, Disney Plus doing okay. Uh, ESPN, not so much. But I was buying it back here sort of late last year in the 80s on the view that, yowza, man, I can buy Disney on you know at eighty dollar. When last did we have Disney at eighty dollar? Let's remove the pandemic. I mean, we we're pretty much going eight years ago. Again, another iconic company. Now I don't expect Disney to shoot the lights out. I don't expect Nike to shoot the lights out. I'm just buying some top global brands at good prices. I'll take the dividend flow. The dividend flow is not going to be massive. They're just great investments. And the point with great investments is sometimes you can pick them up at great prices. It was Disney last year. I think there's every chance that it is this year going to be uh, looking in terms of, of uh, Nike. Now, yeah, are there others out there? Of course, is this the best investment in the world? Well, no. It's just a stock I've long liked to hold and just thought the valuations were completely crazy. And now I look at it and I think, yeah, that valuation is suddenly not so crazy. So keen to own that, picking that up. Uh, quick last thing. We've got the Satrix NASDAQ ETF, STXNDQ. It has been a feeder fund. It is now going to become a standard fund. You would have got a letter from your broker if you hold it, asking you to vote. The difference is feeder fund. They just go and buy a ETF and stick it in. Nice and simple. Then you get to bulk. They're now north of 5 billion assets under management. And what you now do is you're like, well, hang on a second. I just can go buy these shares ourselves. We've got enough uh, 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 size. We can go and buy them individually. So it will be the same shares, the same weightings. The only difference, the total expense ratio will be a little bit lower. So we win in that regard. If you've got the letter, you get to vote. I think you've got until the end of September to vote. Uh, and the changes, if approved, will happen at the end of October. So just a heads up on that. A lot of folks were saying to me, what the heck is happening? I don't know why they've got this letter and I don't know what it means. What it means is it will be a slightly cheaper ETF for you going forward. So that is good news. Remember, next week, no show whatsoever. Uh, we will be back the week after, of course, but next week, no show. JC is a registered trademark of the JC Limited. JC Direct is an independent broadcast and is not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has it been authorized or otherwise approved by JC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of JC Limited. So that's it for this week. Uh, as I said, we will not be back next week. We'll be back on the uh, 12th of, I'm trying, is it the 12th? Yep, it will be Thursday, the 12th. I record Wednesday afternoon on the 11th. If you're in Johannesburg, the Money Summit is on the 10th, which is the Tuesday. If you go to moneysummit.co.za, use the coupon code MONEYWEBGUEST 
all one word. You can get a free ticket. It is all day. I will be there. Tons of other people will be there, uh, and you can get in for free. That will be Tuesday, the 10th of September. And if you're coming, come say how's it. We will see you there. Otherwise, I'm off to the beach. Uh, everyone, look after yourself. As always, if you can, look after somebody else. My name is Simon Brown. We'll chat again in two weeks' time. Cheers, all.